by using my computer. Our Bible readings today come from Psalm 42 and the Gospel of Luke verses 24 and 35 and the words are taken from the Good News Bible. Psalm 42 is a lament psalm written by men who formerly were, were able to freely worship God in, and <clears throat> in God with the Lord's people. But sometimes, but something has changed and now they find themselves removed from the religious life that they formerly enjoyed and this they missed greatly. The prayer of someone in exile. As a deer longs for the stream of cool water, so for you, O God, I thirst for you, my living God. When can I go and worship you in person? Day and night I cry, and these, heart, these tears are my only food. And all the time my enemies ask, Where is your God? My heart breaks when I remember the past when I went with the crowds to the house of the Lord and led them as they walked down the streets. Happily, the crowd was singing and shouting praises to God. Why am I so sad? Why am I so troubled? I will put my faith in God and once again I will praise him for my Saviour and my God. Here in exile, my heart is breaking, and so I turn my thoughts to him. He has sent waves of sorrow over my soul. Chaos reigns in me like a flood, like a waterfall, thundering down the Jordan River from Mount Hermon and Mount Miraz. May the Lord show his constant love during the sky during this day, so that I may have a song at night as I pray for the God of my life. The God, my defender, I say, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go on suffering from the cruelty of, your, of my enemies? I am crushed by their insults as they keep on asking me, where is your God? Why am I so sad? Why am I so troubled? I will put my hope in God and once again I will praise him, my Saviour and my God. Second reading is from Luke 24, 13 to 35. The Emmaus story is a post-resurrection appearance story where Jesus appears in the, the human state, though it is resurrection body form. Information fills these narratives and details of time and place of eyewitnesses. The walk to Emmaus. On that same day, two of Jesus' followers were going to the village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were taking they were talking to each other about all the things that had just happened. As they talked and discussed things, Jesus himself drew near and walked along with them. They saw him, but somehow did not recognize him. Jesus said to them, What are you talking about to each other as they walk along? They stood still with sad faces. And one of them, Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening here these last few days? What things? he asked. The things that happened to Jesus at Nazareth, they answered. This man was a prophet and was considered by God and all other people to be powerful in everything he said and did. Our priests, our chief priests and rulers made, 
handed him over to, the, to, to be sentenced to death and he was crucified and he had dropped and he had hoped that they would be the one who would go in to set, us, set, set, set Austria, Israel free. Besides all that, it is now the third day since it happened. Some of the women of our group praised us, surprised us when they went down to the tomb and they could not find the body. They came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who told them what he was alive. Some of the group went down to the tomb and found it exactly as the woman had said, and they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, How foolish you are! How slow you are to believe everything the prophets said! Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer those things and then to enter, to enter his glory? And Jesus explained to them what he had said about himself in all the scriptures, beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he wanted to go further, but they told him to stay, with, to stay with and eat with us today. It was getting dark, so they went in and stayed with him. He sat down to eat with them. He took bread and said a blessing. Then he broke the bread and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he, dis and he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, wasn't it like a fire burning in us when he talked to us in the road and explained the scriptures to us? They told, he told, they told us at once and went back to Jerusalem where they found the eleven disciples gathered with another, with others, saying, the Lord is risen, indeed he has appeared to Simon. And two of them explained what they had happened on the, on the road and how they had recognized my Lord, the Lord, when he had broken the bread. This is the word of the Lord. May I say, uh, as I'm getting myself organised here, that it is always a joy to come back to Walkerville. But it does present a couple of problems. Um, it's always good when you see that uh, children who were much younger when I was here have grown up. But the problem is that when you're walking from your car into the, towards the church and someone whom you thought was older than you actually is younger, <laughs> which means that I'm getting considerably older, so uh, there we are. But the truth is, uh, I guess for Marilyn and myself, part of our heart is still here and we just love to come back and you're a great group of people. Sorry about those who have of you who have come since I left and you may say what's he talking about but just talk to one of the other brothers and sisters in here and they'll tell you. <laughs> now I did ask Mark, I should say thanks for the opportunity to preach, uh, I appreciate you asking. Um, I wanted to read one other reading um, because I wanted to put it in context. Um, so that's why I asked Mark if I could read it. It comes from John chapter 6. But if you look at what I want to read in context, the beginning of the chapter is uh, the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, and then uh, the disciples going off in a boat and Jesus going off into the mountains by himself because he realises that after that miracle that the people want to take him by force and... Uh, bring him in as king and it's not the right time and then uh, eventually the crowd finds out where Jesus is and he continues to teach and he says uh, that uh, you know you really were more interested in the food that I gave you in terms of the feeding of the 5,000 rather than what I have to say but he goes on to teach them about uh, what it means to follow him and 
soon after there is the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. So the reading I've got is just between the feeding of the 5,000 and uh, Palm Sunday and the events of the crucifixion. We're starting John 6, beginning at verse 53. Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I tell... Sorry, there's a slip back to the old translation. <laughs> Jesus said to them, <laughs> Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. Then, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Let us pray. We thank you Dear loving Father, for the privilege and joy of being able to worship you. We come, Lord, from different backgrounds, different needs, different challenges and different temptations. We pray that within our context that we find ourselves, that you will speak your word into our hearts and beings and encourage us as your people this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Back in the 90s, when I was uh, ministering in the Summertown Parish, I was preaching at a little church in Ashton. And uh, I was preaching from a passage in Ezekiel uh, where it, uh, it has the experience of the uh, vision of the valley of dry bones that Ezekiel was given and of course it was given to a people who were uh, despairing about their future and uh, what God would do with them in exile and so on and so I was giving the historical context of this vision and uh, trying to convey how the people of Israel felt at that time when someone from the congregation, realising that uh, their church was small and in decline, shouted out, that's us! <laughs> it was. When I thoughtfully read the, the words of Psalm 42, I cannot help but exclaim, that's me. Why? Because I can 
deeply identify with the ups and downs, the convictions and the doubts, the sadness and the disappointments, the fluctuations of faith, the nearness and the distance of God that are scattered throughout this psalm. For example, my soul thirsts for God. My tears have been my food. The taunt, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? All your waves and breakers have swept over me. I say to God, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, suppressed by the enemy? They're pretty tough sentiments. Pretty emotional outcries. I wonder if you can identify with just a few of them. Maybe different situation, maybe slightly different variations, but maybe they're part of your journey as they've been part of mine. Now, as we heard before, this psalm is one of the psalms known as a psalm of lament. Just a few, well, quite a few psalms are actually lament psalms. They're honest psalms. They speak of deep anguish of spirit before God. Here the writer fluctuates between faith and despair. And certainly well away from the temple in Jerusalem where his uh, Jewish family regularly went to worship. It's a desert experience. He says it's like a deer, a female deer, raising its head, sniffing for the scent of nearby water. It's deeply emotional, this psalm. Despair, words that are penned by a person utterly overwhelmed. I wonder how you identify with the words, with the emotional experiences of this psalm. Now, the thing that I want to speak about is what I call responding when life or even faith doesn't make sense anymore. <coughs> I'm actually a joyful, positive Christian, but there are times in our life when we face situations which call us to question our life and faith and so on. And each of the Bible readings that I've selected have something to say about that kind of experience. The followers of Jesus have been listening to Jesus' teaching around his saying, I am the bread of life. Now John's Gospel has, uh, I think it's about six I am sayings that are sort of pivotal in the structure of the Gospel. And this one is the one where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. <coughs> As I said, following on from the feeding of the 5,000. With the awareness of his uh, future death and resurrection, Jesus here uses the language of consumption to tease out for his uh, disciples what it meant to follow him, what it meant to have faith in him. He says, faith in me is like eating my flesh and drinking my blood. He says, this is real food real drink that enables a person to have eternal life. He tells them that he has come down from heaven, sent from the Father, and the people around him don't understand. How can this be? Isn't he Mary and Joseph's son, they say. 
On hearing this, John records for us in his uh, gospel that many of his disciples said, this is a hard saying. Who can accept it? And from this time, many of Jesus' disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Now we know that in his teaching, Jesus didn't necessarily make it easy uh, for people to follow him. He spoke of the need for self-denial, uh, to seek him first if they were to follow him. They were told to weigh up the cost. And so many even today find it too costly to follow Jesus. It's easier to follow a life of comfort, to look at other attractions, to make some money, to advance in all the opportunities that life affords us. And many of us, probably most of us, even if we ourselves have not succumbed to the temptations that we face, know of people who have gradually drifted away and no longer follow Jesus. Certainly I do. The reading from Luke's Gospel, Luke 24, gives us a well-known and rather beautiful picture of two of Jesus' followers who likewise are on the verge of giving up. They are actually totally shattered. They're despairing as they reflect on the crucifixion events and the astonishing reports by some of the women who say that the tomb is empty and uh, some of them have seen Jesus. Now, placed within a Jewish historical context, and expectations of a coming Messiah that would hopefully uh, rid the Jewish people from the Roman uh, rulership and so that they could establish a Jewish nation, then one can understand how all their hopes are dashed and they are just totally in despair. It's summed up in verse 21 with the immediate comment that Jesus receives as he joins them as they walk along the road. From two people with saddened faces flow the words, but we had hoped that he was the one who was to redeem Israel. I'm sure every one of us here this morning have experienced hopes and dreams that started well but have not materialised. <clears throat> Maybe in marriages, uh, human friendships, family life, business enterprises, uh, enterprises, even retirement. And so the list goes on. If you place these within a world situation that seems so often crazy, and wracked with conflict and war, where our futures seem more uncertain and thousands of refugees seeking a home. Intersperse this with the larger churches that disappoint us through um, unethical values, etc., etc. If you watch the recent SBS program on Hillsong, and I've taken people from my Hills Church some years ago to Hillsong, it's pretty easy to feel that the mat has been pulled from under your feet. Well, what do we do when our lives are punctuated with these kinds of experiences? Do we give up? Do we doubt? Do we question the reality of God and what we've believed? Do we move away from a worshipping Christian community and gradually become distant and secular in our outlook and our worldview? Or maybe we simply quietly withdraw. The alternatives are many and varied. <clears throat> now let me return to each of the Bible readings 
and suggest a way to respond. Now, my main text is actually Psalm 42, and the other two gospel readings will throw just a little bit of additional light on the subject. <clears throat> Looking at Psalm 42, I think the first glimpse of a way forward for the psalmist at least comes in verse 4. He says, These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. The importance of remembering from where we have come. The foundations of our faith. The importance of a worshipping community. They're all tucked away in that verse 4. The psalmist chooses to remember the important things that are formative in his faith journey. Sadly, at times I've discovered that many people choose to remember their negative experiences of the church. And this acts like a cancer when their faith and life is in crisis mode. I too could tell you of difficult people that I've experienced in my life as a minister, where I've been deeply impacted where I've been saddened, when I've wept deeply in disbelief. However, I could sit with you and share in coffee after coffee after coffee after coffee and tell you how privileged I have been to meet and to minister to Christian people in the church who have enriched my life beyond imagination, beyond measure. These people have stood the test through the crisis of their life. They act as a model that stands up before me that I want to emulate as I continue the journey. They are the people of Hebrews 11 and 12, the people of the picture of faith who have endured and call me to continue in the journey. I've discovered that I'm a stronger Christian when I remember the community of faith of which I'm called to be a part. These are the people, the experiences and relationships that I choose to remember when my life is in crisis. Now the term that I use, and it's not one that I've made up, is what I call reflective faith. Faith that is strengthened when I choose to look back and to remember, recalling God's faithfulness in the past so that I'm encouraged in the present. This has become a central part of my life. Why? I'll tell you why. Because I forget. I forget. It has now become official in our family that we, as far as we know, are not having any more grandchildren. We've been told, so we expect that's what's going to happen. And so that's always good news for the grandmother because you can start clearing out some of the boxes of toys and things that you sort of put there just in case. And Marilyn was doing that and she said, you know, there's these boxes of, of uh, albums and photos. We haven't looked at them for such a long time. And I said, we ought to have an evening just looking at photos. So we did. Out come the boxes and the photos and the albums. Who was that? <laughs> Where was that one taken? You see, we at least forget so easily. That's why we need reflective faith. 
we need also to come to Holy Communion where we remember the foundations of our faith and to whom we belong. Remembering of the call of Jesus to this in remembrance of me. What do you remember? What do you focus your thinking upon? What do you recall as you go along in your faith journey? Recently, <clears throat> on the drum, and I don't suggest you always watch the John drum on the ABC, but Marilyn and I tend to. One night there was a really good segment in the program, and it was about the issue of dementia. And the lady who was on the panel has had dementia for a number of years, and she was telling her story. She said, when I was diagnosed with dementia, I went home and got into bed to die. I didn't go up, get up, unless I had to. I didn't go out and see people. I didn't wash my hair. I was told that I only had a certain time to live. Then she said, somehow I got in touch with Dementia Australia. And they said to me, don't remember simply what you've lost, but what you still have. And live according to what you have and not according to what you've lost. And she said, that changed my life. She was vibrant, she'd gone on living, she'd gone out and embraced life. That's a secular story, but the principle applies to we who are people of faith. Now, the second thing that the psalmist does is that he speaks to his soul. Not only in a questioning format, but giving his soul fresh direction. So he says, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God twice in the psalm, halfway through and right at the end. It's a kind of self-talk to address the feelings of being cast down and overwhelmed. You know, I talk to myself. Do you? The real question is, how do you talk to yourself? Does it reinforce your misery? or bring you back to a positive faith and balanced outlook. When the psalmist does this, he finds that the waterfalls, the waves and the breakers that sweep over him actually belong to God. He calls them your waterfalls, your waves and your breakers. Here is a change of perspective a growing awareness of the difficulties and the huge issues that he faces in his life, that God is with him and around him. Now if we go to uh, the Emmaus story, these two people were overwhelmed by the recent horrendous events that had enveloped their souls and sought to just destroy any hope that they had. But as they talked to Jesus, <clears throat> and Jesus talked to them, they saw that God was at work in these terrible events, that these events were in actual fact a fulfilment of Old Testament prophecy. And so their thinking changed their outlook changed. Despair was lifted as they discovered that here was the risen Christ and that these events were not just events that came upon them. They were events in which God was at work to achieve his purposes. And so they travelled back to Jerusalem in the night, transformed people. Now the uh, hymn that we've uh, sung this morning, 
I actually uh, got off my computer. The reason I was using it was that uh, At Jim's funeral that we were privileged to be at the other day, that was the selection of one of the hymns. It is well with my soul. Why do I refer to that? Because it speaks of the foundational truths of our faith that shine into the grief and the sadness of loss in our human life. It speaks into our souls the truths of the gospel message and the hope that we have in God. The psalmist says, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. My third point I want to make, realising that we are called to live both in eternity and also in time. I think this is so important. If our living is only concerned with time, our present mortal life, then we will have a very, very limited perspective. We will agonise over our unanswered questions, the why of suffering, and risk becoming bitter and despairing people will be like the lady who was interviewed on the ABC program, Gardening Australia. She said, we live in such a crazy world that I have to retreat to my garden to gain perspective. Well, I'm a keen, a keen gardener as well, but I don't rely on my garden to give me true perspective. The refrain that comes twice in this psalm exhorts us to put our hope in God beyond ourselves and uh, beyond our limited understanding in this world to trusting in God. The psalmist is well able to lament the sadness and the emotional difficulties and yet turn from them to put his trust in God alone. To live and take seriously both time and eternity as crucial aspects of our existence will mean for us living with unanswered questions and limited human perspective and at the same time to learn to trust in God alone and to put our hope in him. My Renovar Spiritual Formation Bible, which is a very helpful Bible to have, I think is very helpful at this point and I re want to read a note to you in terms of the Emmaus story. God will reveal his glory in those flashes of light between mortal and immortal, between the now and the forever. He will incarnate his power and his love in the Son of God when we least expect it. Our task is not to figure everything out or imagine every angle that God might come at us from, but to stay on the roads of our years, plodding on, encouraging one another with the voices and mysteries of heaven. It is only that. To stay on the road until the God in disguise joins us or eventually comes to sit at our table, or we at his. Let me wrap up what I'm saying this morning. In John chapter 6, Jesus seen many of his disciples turning away from him, turns to his 12 disciples, the intimate group, and he says to them, you do not want to leave too, do you? In other words, is my teaching too hard for you as well? Simon Peter, in a moment of inspiration, replies, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. For Peter and presumably the rest of, his, of the disciples, 
There's no one else. No one else to turn to. Here is Jesus whom they've come to trust, the one who has come from God. This requires their loyalty, their faith in the testing times ahead. And they were very close at hand. And so the question is for us, do you want to leave? Do you want to stop following? Has it become too difficult? Or have you concluded that there is no other to go to, whatever the circumstances you face? Many years ago, when I was a teenager, we sang many choruses in Christian circles, of which I was a part of. One went like this. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Who loves me like Jesus loves me? Who promises to be with me always? Who promises to give me eternal life? I have never found any other alternatives, even though there are always sub subtle temptations along the way of following Jesus. For me, there is no turning back. And may this be for you as well. Let us pray. Loving Father, in your presence, we, <clears throat> we may ask ourselves, where are we at this moment? What testing am I experiencing? What disappointments do I face? Lord Jesus, we look at them. Perhaps even feel the deep emotional attachments we have to them and we own them. We take them and place them before you. Help us, help me to follow you for you have the words of eternal life. In your name we pray. Amen.